Correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I do believe that before, like, for example, this cracker comment on Weekend Update, the most politically incorrect and emotionally charged statement ever made on Weekend Update was this. Jane, you ignorant slut. <laughs> Where are we going? To the day it all began and ended. The moment that changed everything. Welcome to McDonald's. Can I take your order? Yeah, I'd like to get a 10-piece McNugget and uh, a bunch of the Szechuan sauce. Like, as much as you're allowed to give me. In, in 1998, they had this promotion for the Disney film Mulan, where they where they, they, they created a new sauce for the McNuggets called Szechuan sauce. And it's delicious. There is no central metaphor to this video in the series. Because for the greater underlying monomyth from which this series takes its beats, there really is, as it says on the tin, one myth. Simba lives an idyllic life at Pride Rock, but then the tornado comes and sweeps up Dorothy. Bill Murray's character doesn't believe it and jumps off the roof of a building, only to wake back up at the same time on the same day again. Eventually, Neo is able to accept the deep intricacies of his connection to the Matrix, and at the very last second, Obi-Wan Kenobi sacrifices his life so Dorothy might be able to defeat the Wicked Witch. Rewarded with the Holy Grail, our hero returns to Pride Rock to confront his uncle, Scar. But the Ferris have been planning and captured Jesus, hanging him on the cross as punishment. But Frodo came back and was able to save the Shire. Oh, sorry. Spoilers. Except, these stories follow this format for a reason. Well, multiple reasons in different eras, but we'll get to that in a bit. They may not contain all the stages and elements, however, they will always feature three distinct stages or acts of this play, if you will. It begins with the departure, whether it's Neo entering the Matrix or Luke leaving Tatooine. It moves into the descent and initiation, which are sometimes squeezed together as one act or other times sub subdivided, such as Pinocchio's entering the belly of the whale, or the second, entire second book of the Lord of the Rings. And with mastery obtained in the initiation, it concludes with the return. A return home that sets the hero back on the path of their destiny, whether it be Jesus' capture, crucifixion, and resurrection, or just Dorothy's awakening, transformed by the experience of her dream. Transformation within a person is not easy to describe. You'll often find idioms used in English and other languages for it, due to the complexity of describing what is so often a subtle, nearly invisible change from the outside, but proves to be the greatest trial one has experienced from the inside. It seems like the best we have, from a cultural perspective, is the creation of legends, since making the full circle of the monomyth is genuinely a rare feat, a difficult feat, and one most of us accomplish on a daily, or weekly, or monthly, or semi-annual basis, sometimes ac accomplishing multiple in parallel. It's the natural process of learning and adapting. Let's take away the emotional concepts introduced by the writer's perspective on this relatable experience, and instead take the perspective of a teacher. As per Kolb's learning styles published in 1984 we are provided a circle of four states of learning the concrete experience which can be equated to our hero's experience which forces him to depart from what he knew to what he doesn't know reflective observation and abstract conceptualization which equate roughly to the descent into the unknown and the initiation toward mastery that is achieved and active experimentation which rather cleanly equates to our hero's bringing experience and understanding back home to overcome what would have been insurmountable before the journey. But there's one more arrow. Active experimentation creates its own concrete experiences in real life. And that's kind of where these stories leave the applicable rails and remind you they're only stories. It's all been wrapped up nice and tidy, but when it comes to learning, hell, when it comes to adapting to changes in life, each cycle leads to and layers upon others, and there is rarely one central crisis or responsibility to which one must attend. But if you're able to take each of those steps, concrete experience, reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, and active experimentation, and apply them to military strategy theory, well, you'd find that they too have some methodologies for the purpose of adapting to a larger force or overcoming a greater challenge. The OODA loop, O-O-D-A, observe, orient, decide, act. It begins with observe, which skips leaving home entirely and just puts you in the thick of the unknown, taking in the information from your current concrete experiences. It then shifts to orient, in which you make the reflective observations of the world around you and learn from the very nature of the abyss in which you're stuck. You then make your decision, accepting that you are capable of accomplishing what needs to be done to save the world or just solve a math problem. And then you act. You actively experiment. You return home to apply what you have learned 
to save them as well, or just better position yourself for the next run of the cycle. If you're able to think and operate faster than the person in control of the larger force, you will be able to overcome them, according to Colonel John Boyd, who developed the loop as a combat operations process, but has since applied to commercial operations, game theory, and of course, learning process theory. And our and the American Air Force pilots live by UDA. It is the heart of their training, as well as the training of those supporting them from the ground. As once they are in the air, they are a one or two man operation that must adapt to situations as quickly as possible, regardless of where they have to enter the UDA loop. Flying in clear airspace leaves you with the same concrete experience for some time. However, the sudden appearance of an enemy pilot will quickly push you to act. Whether with a practice technique used to draw the enemy closer and gather information, such as pulling up into the sun, or slipping into cloud cover to get better positioning. At this point, it's back to observation. You have to know things like travel speed, maneuverability, equipped weapons, size, and gather that information as quickly as possible, at which point you orient yourself according to whether the enemy is behaving like a combatant or a non-combatant, and that's when the dogfight begins. This practice loop streams in real time through the pilot's brain as he learns about his opponent by accepting what he doesn't know and departs from his current operational strategy in order to reflect upon and consider, find creative means by which to master this unknown, and then he acts, experimenting, returning the enemy's gambit with another, only to step back into observation mode once again. Transformation in the monomyth is enormous, even world-changing, because just like the pilot who creatively saves his own life and takes down the pilot gunning to kill him, solving a problem is a thrilling and often enormous experience from the inside. It feels great, and as such the descriptions are great, even exaggerated, and those stories become legends and books and movies and video games. But in the real world, you have to keep that ego in check and judge the scale of that action by observing the concrete not internal, experiences, which could be as impressive as our pilot or as common in every day as fixing a single bug in a piece of software or successfully making a sale in business. The monomyth is something equally just as simple, an adaptation or accomplishment completed in the most natural way a human can, given the fictionalized presentation of the outside, to convey the emotional experience on the inside. And hell, it works just as well for victimhood stories as it does for hero stories, as you begin to look into the cases of false rape accusations. But that's a story for another time. Now, of course, you might be asking yourself, well then what's your transformation, Sevi? And I could say if there have been many, but I'm not here to spin a tale or act like I'm some kind of hero. I have learned quite a lot in the last couple months, experienced a lot, and have accomplished a lot. But there's clearly no transcendence in the story I have to tell. Just more learning cycles and uter loops and miniature heroes' journeys. More work, albeit work I love more than any other. If I had to give a section from Campbell's analysis of the monomyth to describe my transformation, though, it would be his freedom to live trope. The hero is the champion of things becoming, not of things become, because he is. Before Abraham was, I am. God does not mistake his apparent changelessness in time for the permanence of being, nor is he fearful of the next moment or other thing as destroying the permanent with its change. Nothing retains its own form, but nature, the greater renewer, ever makes up forms from forms. But that's getting into the return now, isn't it? I guess you're gonna have to wait till next time. That's my one-armed man! I'm not driven by avenging my dead family, Morty! That was fake! I I'm driven by finding that McNugget sauce! Nuggets. I want that Mulan McNugget sauce, Morty! Mulan. That's my series arc, Morty! Hell? If it takes nine seasons, I want my McNugget tipping sauce, Szechuan sauce, Morty!